Hi, my name is Kath Bergman. I am a junior at Butler University studying middle secondary English education. And today I will be sharing my presentation called um, We Didn't Start the Fire, Billy McFarland Did, a deep dive into logical and emotional appeals in Fire, the greatest party that never happened. It's important to start by introducing the film and the uh, festival as a whole. So what is Fire and what do we really know about it? Fire was a festival we all saw on social media and yet knew nothing about. And the film um, really seeks to fill in gaps um, in our knowledge as an audience and doing does so in a way that attempts to give the full picture of what really went on from start to finish. So in Chris Smith, the director's film, uh, Fire, the Greatest Party That Never Happened, the documentarians seek to uncover the truth about a festival that seemed and was too good to be true, and the audience is given the full story being led through the details of planning from start to finish. So we can ask what the goal of the film was, and um, the filmmakers really had one goal, and that was to leave the audience with the lasting impression that co-founder Billy McFarland was a total fraud from the beginning. And they do this a variety of ways, but mostly through the use of emotional appeals and logical appeals. Um, they appeal to viewers' emotions by using direct testimony and interviews from FIRE employees, as well as the repetition of powerful footage showing McFarland refusing to take responsibility for his actions. And additionally, they use logical appeals like the use of a countdown um, leading up to the festival's intended start date in order to remind the viewer of the dire circumstances surrounding the festival and um, creating a sense of chaos and tension as time goes on. And overall, the film seeks to place all of the blame on Billy McFarland, painting him um, as the manipulative criminal behind the entire operation. Next, we can think about what Aristotle has to say about the use of rhetoric. Um, so emotional appeals are what Aristotle would have referred to as pathos, and this can be a positive or a negative thing. So emotional appeals can be very manipulative and um, kind of urge a guttural response from the viewer, um, but can also be very positive and be done tastefully, where um, a sense of empathy or sympathy is simply um, aroused in the audience member on the part of the um, person on screen. It is the lowest level of rhetorical appeal, and its only goal is really to evoke some sort of emotional response from the audience. Next, the logical appeal is what Aristotle would have called logos, and it is driven heavily by evidence. Um, the documentarians in this case would be using a logical appeal in order to make overarching claims using statistics, um, hard facts, things that we know to be true. And so the audience is more likely to come to their point of view um, if they have um, evidence backing them up. And finally, I would argue that this documentary is a form of judicial rhetoric. Um, and Aristotle says that judicial rhetoric is um, used to um, place accusatory blame on individuals to call into question their judgment and whether their actions were justifiable. Um, and because this film is extremely accusatory and places all the blame on Billy McFarland, I would say that this is a, a, an example of judicial rhetoric, um, also because it focuses on past actions. So moving into the different appeals. First, we can look at emotional appeal. Um, and the ways that the documentarians do this um, are three main ways. Um, direct interviews from employees, testimony about financial burden, and the use of footage that shows Billy McFarland not taking responsibility for his actions. Um, first is the direct interviews. So one island employee, a local, um, was hired on to see about the accommodations for sleeping for the guests as well as flight accommodations for getting guests to the island itself. Um, and in his research, he really found um, that it wasn't realistic to have this many people staying and flying to such a small island. Um, so he raised his concerns to the officials um, like Billy McFarland and was ultimately asked to step back um, and was fired from his position. And um, it's unclear whether or not he was paid for his time. He never 
makes a claim about that. And then second, um, sexual exploitation of a consultant for last minute preparations. Um, one particular man um, who claimed to be kind of a close friend of Billy McFarland's, who had worked with him in the past, um, was called on as a consultant and uh, Billy McFarland himself made a personal call to this man and asked him to take one for the team and perform a sexual act in order to acquire uh, the Evian water that was being held in customs. Um, and so this man was sent to go do that. Luckily did not have to go do that. Um, but the audience's attention is being drawn to the fact that Billy really crossed an ethical line there. Second, um, we can talk about the testimony about financial burden. Um, so Billy McFarland um, really had a hand in the financial distress of a lot of people as a result of his actions. Um, he blocked unemployment for employees directly following the scam itself. Um, so instead of letting these employees go and firing them so that they could collect unemployment benefits, he decided to keep them on as employees and simply cut their pay, terminating their pay, um, so that they weren't getting any money from him, but they could not claim unemployment. Next, um, there were outstanding bills left on employees' personal credit cards, upwards of tens of thousands of dollars um, that these people may not have had. Um, to pay back and that money was never returned to them. Um, it was simply, you know, Billy would call them and say, you know, you need to do this for the company. They'd say, okay, with the understanding that they would be paid back and they never were paid back. Um, we also, most importantly, see the exploitation of a particular female business owner on Grand Exuma. Um, so on this next orange slide, you will see a picture of the woman on Grand Exuma who owns a restaurant. Um, during the actual scam, during the day of the festival itself, um, the Billy McFarland and the other executives had nowhere to put all of the newly arrived guests. So they sent all of them to her restaurant, and this was upwards of two, three, four hundred people at a time. Um, just arriving to her restaurant, she had nowhere to put them. Um, she took, they took all of her alcohol, basically. Um, she did not receive any money from all of this. She took a financial loss of um, over $50,000. And it's a very big part of the film. Uh, we focus on her for quite a few minutes. Um, all of the music is cut in the background, and it's just uh, an image of her talking about her personal distress. And finally, the last portion of emotional appeal is the footage of Billy McFarland refusing to take responsibility for his actions that is repeated throughout the film. Um, and this is a piece of footage of a reporter um, directly asking Billy, um, do you have remorse for what you've done? And he simply puts on a smile and says, I will give a comment with my lawyer present at some other time. Um, and so it kind of highlights the director's the filmmaker's view that Billy was to blame, but he did not take responsibility for it. And um, this is shown periodically through the film just to keep that in the back of the viewer's mind. Next, we have the logical appeal. Um, and the filmmakers use two main ways to do this, and that is through the discussion of McFarland's past, present, and future, as well as a linear timeline and countdown. So first, um, they focus on the three stages of Billy's life, first being his past with a company called Magnesis that was a fraudulent credit card company um, that really sought to create an exclusive club of credit card owners that had access to various different um, exclusive clubs, events, and the like. Um, and this turned out to be a scam um, that happened several years before Billy was um, ever a part of any fire scam. Next, they move into the fire scam itself, which takes place um, for the majority of the film, um, as well as a little bit of interest in um, a company called VIP Access that happened directly after the fire scam um, where Billy was involved and yet another scam um, where customers were told that they could get discounted tickets to 
um, events, exclusive events like the Met Gala and the Academy Awards and things like that, um, which the Met Gala does not sell tickets, tickets to the public. So um, it was very quickly and easily found to be a scam and he was taken down for that as well. And then in the future, the um, director's focus on Billy's ban from being a CFO. He did serve jail time um, and is no longer able to serve um, as the CFO for any business company in the future. And there is some speculation from employees that they wouldn't be surprised if Billy were to show up um, in the media and the news at some point in the future um, for having been a part of some sort of scam. Secondly, they use a linear timeline and a countdown to appeal to the viewer's logic. So um, a linear timeline is used painting the story from start to finish. Um, and this shows a great deal of goodwill towards the viewer um, because they're trying not to um, confuse the viewer, to put them in a position where they don't know what's going on or what has led to certain things happening. Um, they get the full story of here's what happened in chronological order. And they also use a countdown periodically. Um, you'll see on the left side of this slide um, an example of a screenshot of what happens in the film. The filmmakers intentionally included um, a timeline and a countdown of what was happening when in order to clue the viewer in and remind them that the often there were only a certain amount of days left and big portions of progress had yet to be made. Um, and big decisions had yet to be made about um, changing the timeline of anything, but it really serves the purpose of keeping the viewer in the loop and reminding them of how things were not adding up. And on this next orange slide, you'll see a picture of Billy McFarland. This is a screenshot from the film, and it shows it's an intentional um, use of an image by the documentarians in order to kind of prove their point. Um, so Billy is standing literally above all of the customers at the, the fire festival and he is trying to reassure them. But um, the fact that he is standing above them as like a scapegoat, um, a rightful, rightfully scapegoated person, um, really proves the director's point and kind of um, in the back of the viewer's mind, they're thinking about, okay, he is the one person that is to blame for all of this. Um, and he is surrounded by his con the consequences of his actions. So we can also talk about the gaps in the film and what is notably missing from the, um, from the documentary as a whole. Um, one thing that we never see is Billy McFarlane's side of the story. He um, never gives interviews the way that other employees do. Um, there's footage of him and of Ja Rule but neither one of the co-founders were interviewed for the documentary, which I found very interesting because um, other documentaries about the same topic did include interviews from Billy McFarland. So it raises the question of whether the audience really got the full story, whether the filmmakers are trustworthy or unreliable, um, and what important other puzzle pieces were missing from the story. Um, because although the employees' stories really matched up and um, painted this picture, um, we never get to hear from the man himself. So because he is such an important piece of all of this, it would be in the best interest of the filmmakers to include some sort of testimony from Billy McFarland. And finally, we can finish by talking about the film's popularity as a whole and why um, why it's been so popular and how contemporary documentary shapes how we think about um, and how we talk about failed businesses. So in the modern day business or businesses, um, in the modern day viewers and the audience um, of readers of books, um, watchers of documentaries, TV shows, they're all looking for pretty much the same thing, which is a sense of justice. Um, our world is notably devoid of justice right now, um, as government officials, um, people in high places of power are generally, you know, left out. Uh, they're not seeing the same justice that everyday people um, who don't have the wealth or the power to get themselves out of it um, have. So that's part of why we can't get enough of watching these documentaries, 
reading these books about scams um, because we think we can kind of see that justice, see whoever is responsible get that um, retribution, the consequences that they deserve. Um, so here we do see Billy McFarland going to jail, um, and although the people who were affected never really received their money, we do see that he personally is punished. So that's part of why it's so successful. And we can also think about um, why the topic, why the event was such a highly talked about um, thing. Festivals are really seen as an escape, um, a haven from the troubles of everyday life where you can spend $400 to escape from capitalism for a long weekend. Um, and although we're surrounded by marketing materials and sponsored food tents, we tend to put that out of our mind because um, we're in what we consider to be a utopia where we don't have to worry about working. We can just be with the people around us and be focused on one common thing, which is the music. Um, so this documentary is successful because it, among others, reminds viewers of the inherent ties that festivals have to capitalism and how corrupt businesses can become, even the ones that are the most ideal in our minds. Um, and it really challenge challenges our idea of what a utopia is, whether that's possible. So I would say that the documentary as a whole and the documentarians are very successful in coming up with their argument, in um, conveying their argument to the audience. I was pretty convinced by the end that Billy McFarland was the perpetrator of all of this. And although there are some gaps in the documentary where I would have liked to see more information, um, I felt that overall they did a great job of using emotional and logical appeals to their advantage in order to get the viewer to be on their side. Um, and I would recommend this documentary to anyone looking for um, an entertaining and thought-provoking documentary. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time.